The body is the compass. It will tell you everything. Welcome to the Unquiet Sisterhood, a place where we can talk about real life, work, love, and more from a feminist perspective. I'm Jen Pavich, your host, and now let's dive right in. Hey there, and welcome to episode eight. I am just delighted this week to be able to bring you this juicy conversation that I had with my friend Stacy Herrera. Stacy's the creator of the Sensuality Project, which is a lifestyle movement for women. And through her sensuality focused work, she helps women to explore their sexuality, enhance intimacy, and create deliciously fulfilling relationships. Stacy's also the owner of Fat Belly Baker in LA, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit in this episode as well. Hey, Stacey, and thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. I'm so happy to be here. I love talking to you anyways. You could I love talking to you too. It's been this. far too long. <laughs> yes, you could have said, Stacey, let's stand in a shit storm. And I would have been like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will keep that in mind. <laughs> so it's so great to have you here. And I want to start out for our people that are listening, just hearing a little bit more about you and how you got started doing the work that you do and like a little bit about your story. Can we, can we go there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, I am creator of the sensuality project and the sensuality project is a lifestyle movement. You know, it took me a while to even be able to like, like, I was like, what the fuck is this thing? Right. Um, but it's, it's really a lifestyle movement because for me, sensuality is a way of being, it's not like something that I do. It's not like tied to my sexuality, although I use it that way. Um, it's just, that's literally how I live. And that's how we were all designed to live, except for we got unlearned it because the people around us are completely checked out and no one's really actually paying that much attention to the cues that their body is giving them. Um, but, but it's, it's really about living, um, the deepest, juiciest, most, you know, luscious part of yourself. And sometimes that looks like even being with the shit, but like, you know, standing in shit and acting like you don't smell it is not useful. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not useful. <laughs> so, so it's really about like really connecting and, and, and actually be embodied with the tools that came with your body, which is how life, that's how every other animal lives. Every yeah. single one except for us. Yeah, for sure. And so you just use the term embodied. Like, tell me more about what that means. Um, for me, embodied is just about being in your body on purpose and not time traveling out of it, not numbing out. Like, for example, um, I won't, if I know I'm going to have sex, I won't have a drink because I don't want to be checked out for any part of the experience. So if I know I'm fucking, when I, can, I, I once went out to happy hour. It was like my sister was celebrating something. And one of her friends was like, aren't you going to drink? And I was like, girl, no, I'm going to fuck. <laughs> and she was like... Well, shouldn't you? I was like, no, because alcohol is a depressant and I do not want to be anything to be depressed, oppressed, or repressed while I'm fucking. <laughs> I want to feel all of the things. So I do not consume alcohol if I know I'm going to be having sex. That is awesome. Um, you want to be <laughs> all the way there the whole time. All the way. I want to feel everything. So tell me, were you always kind of drawn to this sensuality work or was there something that got you into this? You feel like you always lived embodied and, or did it take you, did you have to learn to do this? Um, I wasn't embodied on purpose. Um, I've always been, you know, like I can think about like sensual experience. So I was always sensual. I wasn't always aware that I was. And I think awareness makes all the difference. You know, we all do a lot of things. We all smell things and we see things and we feel things. Mm -hmm. We're not always aware of what we're actually, you know, smelling, seeing or feeling, which is what disconnects us. But so I, I was embodied in the sense that I did, sensuality was a way of being, but it was, I was completely unaware. But I remember being, you know, really young, like I had this strawberry shortcake um, bedspread and, you know, comforters weren't out yet. So it was a bedspread. It had batting on the back and, you know, quilted on the top. Yep. And I had like dug a hole into the batting and like plucked it out 
just so that I could feel the texture of the cotton between my fingers. So like I would do that to sweaters. I was always plucking something just because I love the sensation of cotton between my fingers. So, you know, I mean, but this is me in the single digits, right? Like already that was a thing. And I distinctly mm -hmm. remember because I remember how my mother complained about my bedspread having all these holes in it. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, and when we're kids, that kind of sensory seeking behavior feels so natural. It, it is absolutely natural. But then you grow up and, and everything that we do is based on what we've seen after a while, you know? And so if the people around you are all numbed out and disconnected, I mean, my father's an alcoholic, so I watch numbing out up close and personal and you unlearn that stuff. And then before you know it, you become 40 something. And you have no fucking idea. And you're like talking about all the, all, the, all the things you've accomplished and all the ways that those things are unfulfilling. And part of it is that our relationship um, patterns are shitty. And the other part is we have a really, un we're divorced from ourselves. Wow. So tell what, when divorced from ourselves is a powerful statement. And yet, like, I know what you're talking about because I remember kind of, you know, I spent, I would say all of my 20s and half of my 30s divorced from myself mm -hmm. and felt like my body was something to be kind of just navigated around or it was like it didn't belong to me. It was just mm -hmm. this thing that didn't look the way I wanted, that didn't perform the way I wanted, that was just like a pain in the ass, that was an obstacle to be kind of overcome in my life rather than viewing it as kind of, of me, a part of me, you know? And I think that that's really common for women, especially absolutely because we're a sort of conditioned to view ourselves as the object instead of the subject, especially absolutely. of our sexuality. So I know this is something that you think and talk and write about a lot more than I do. So tell me, what do you feel like the difference is between the way that men are conditioned to see their bodies and women? I don't know that there's a difference. I don't know that men are necessarily conditioned to see their bodies either. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I don't think mm -hmm. that, I, I don't, especially like the, the reason I say that is because men are conditioned to, even though, look, let me get my thoughts together. Okay. So men are instinctively, I think more prone to narcissism. I think that they are more prone to narcissism. And part of that might be because the patriarchy tells them they're the bomb.com from the, from the gate. You don't yep. have to do shit. You came with a dick. Everything means you already are on top, <laughs> right? Yep. So they definitely love the look at me, look at me, look at me. And then women are conditioned to look at them, look at them, look at them, right? So I don't know yeah. that it's that they're necessarily conditioned to perceive their body a certain way more than they, are, they perceive masculinity a certain way. Okay. So, so I think that, I think both genders or all genders, I'll say, because now there are more than two. Like, yep. I, I believe that all genders are kind of conditioned to disconnect from, from the perception of their own greatness. I think mm -hmm. that men, because even, even with the patriarchy, like men are conditioned to believe they're great, even if they don't believe they're great. So they're not yes. conditioned to believe in their own greatness. They're conditioned to believe in the greatness of men, which is very yes. different. I love the way that you just this. separated that out. Like that's yes. brilliant. Good. Um, I never said that before today. <laughs> <laughs> and I think too, but I think when it comes to sex, there is a difference because I think that for men, and like, I, I think this is like, you know, this goes back to like when we we're really young and we first kind of learned like what sex is, right? Like, I think men are believed, are conditioned to believe that sex is something that they do, whereas mm -hmm. women are conditioned to believe is, that sex is something that is done to them. Um, I agree with, um, I do think that men are can perform. They're yes. conditioned to perform sex and women are conditioned to be cast second in that performance. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> to be the supporting role. Yes, yes. shall we say? The woman is the supporting role. The Oscars and... happened last night. You know, we can say right. <laughs> yes, the woman is definitely in the supporting role, and she is she is tasked with presenting the statue. So she plays two roles. Yes, <laughs> she has to support him, and she has to praise him, and honor him, and give him yes. the gold statue. That's her yep. job. 
Absolutely. But, that is but I don't true. think that, but men, but again, this goes back to men not being conditioned to believe or to be great. Mm -hmm. You know, they're conditioned to the idea of great because if they were conditioned to be great, they would actually be interested in do and developing sexual skills, which they are not. <laughs> well, because if they sex do, is a skill. It's kind of like, I think for, for men, sex is the end mm -hmm. a lot of times. And for women, it's the means to the end, but that's not necessarily communicated or perceived on either side. A lot of the right. Time. Well, because the the missing piece, both there's an X in in his equation and an X in her equation. And for him, the X is he what he really is desiring. Because most men actually don't want to fuck as much as we think they do, or much as mm -hmm. they think they do. Most of the time, what they really want is to be intimate. I can't tell you how many conversations yes. I have with married men who are like, my wife doesn't have sex with me. But what they really are saying is, I don't feel close. And I feel disconnected. And mm -hmm. what I really miss is intimacy. But the only way I know how to be intimate is to put my penis in her. That's what they yeah. really mean. Yeah. And women, on the other hand, are their ex is, I want intimacy. And I know that if I give him this thing, then he will be intimate with me. Yeah. Which is both, both, both of us have very different ideas and both of us have no fucking idea what we're, what we're really seeking. Yeah. And it's, it's like a missed connection. So you brought up intimacy and I know that intimacy coaching is one of the things that oh, it's you so do. Important to me. It's yeah, so oh, important it's to so me. like it, it is, you know, in many ways kind of our reason for being and yes, yes and it yes. requires connection, connection with your body and connection with someone else. So tell me, how do you define intimacy and how does someone know like when they have that? For me, intimacy is about being vulnerable enough to, to, to allow someone to be close to you. And sometimes that quote, that person is you. That should be the first person you're intimate with. But most of us are not intimate with ourselves. You ever be talk to someone and as soon as you ask them, what they like, especially, and, and I'll, look, I'm going to throw moms under the bus, especially a mom. <laughs> look, I am one, so I'm not. Yep, you know, I hear you. Um, if you ask a mom what she likes, she probably will not know. But ask her what her kid likes, what her husband likes, maybe what the kid who she, who plays with her kid likes. You yep. know what I mean? But because but there's no intimacy with her. She does not have a clue. Mm -hmm. I just had um, dinner with um, my sister and a couple of her childhood friends. And two of them said that when their children became grownups, they actually had no idea what to do because they didn't know what they liked. They didn't know what they believed in. They didn't know what they desired. And that is not uncommon. I'm not yeah. saying it doesn't happen to men, but whatever. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm not saying it yeah. doesn't happen to them, but it happens to them in a very different context because for them, they spent a lot of men don't even realize that they've been in competition with their kids. They're the child's whole life battling yeah. for her attention, you know, because they just literally become the extra kid. Right. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so, so for them, it looks very different. And I don't know that they ever fully disconnect from what they want or what they like. A lot of it is because they have a tendency to insert themselves and center themselves regardless. Yeah, because they're taught that that's okay and that that's yes. acceptable. We live in you know, a male supremacist society. So their desires are Absolutely. valued and centered. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny I hearing you say that and, and women being in a position of not having any idea what they like is I was just saying to someone today that there's one question that I can ask a lot of women that almost always results in either complete confusion or sometimes like breaking down into tears. And that's what do you really want? Because mm -hmm. when that question is one that you don't even feel comfortable asking yourself for, you know, months and years and sometimes decades, it can get harder and harder to answer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And some, some women go their entire lives without ever being able to make the declaration. Even if it's about something small, mm -hmm. I want a nap, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I want a break. Yeah. You know, I, I want to not take care of someone today. Mm -hmm. You know, like even just those low, those are like not really big deals actually. Like you get to take a nap and you get yeah. to have a break and you get to say even to your two-year-old, I can't do, look, mommy has some stuff going on right now and I'm going to need for you 
to be a little bit more account uh, accommodating right now. Can you yeah. please go play over there for a little while? But we yeah. don't even feel comfortable like saying to like, you know, kids get to be kids. Guess what? Kids learn accountability as children. Mm -hmm. and they learn boundaries that? as children. They do sometimes. I think for, I, I don't know that girls learn boundaries as well because they don't often see boundaries or a lot of times they don't see boundaries modeled by women in mm -hmm. our culture. Like they see these very sort of porous, you know, wishy-washy boundaries in our culture. But I also think like, do you find that when you talk to women that are kind of in that place of like, I don't know what I want. Like I have no idea. I don't know what I like. I don't know what I'm into that. It almost, it's like, it feels like, and I know this is how it was for me. Like if you just like, crack that can open like even a little bit to say what I want is a nap like it feels like all of the things might just come rushing out and all of the mm -hmm. wants and desires mm -hmm. and needs and I remember like my biggest fear that I never actually even verbalized but was along the lines of you know if I really get in touch with what I want what if I can't have it Mm. And what will that feel like? You, um, I think that's common. And then the other part of it is, what if what I want is not what I have? Yes. Because then what if, I, what if what I want means saying goodbye? What if I don't want this marriage? Mm -hmm. what, if, what if I don't want to be a mom? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what if what I actually want is, is actually opposing or bumping up against mm -hmm. what's actually true? Yeah. Yeah. What if I want is something that, it is completely the opposite of what I have. Yeah, mm -hmm. those are hard questions. Absolutely. But, you know, but, but I think that part of what makes it hard is there's also this idea that everything is an either or thing. And that is yes. not ever true. No, no, it's no. rarely, you know, it's not going to be this black and white, yes or no, like this or that. Absolutely. Right? We're, we're so afraid of fucking maybe. We're, f we're so afraid of and and pluses, you know, like that's yeah. what gets us because the more pros and cons we have, the more amb ambiguity comes up mm -hmm. because that's how we get in the space of when it's, this is the good thing about this and this is the bad thing. And the more of those things that there are, the more we stay in the, I don't know phase. We get really comfortable yes. with ambiguity, which is actually super fucking stressful. Ambiguity yeah. is more stressful than no. It's more yeah. stressful than either or being ambiguous is like, it is the death of everything. Yeah. And staying stuck and doing nothing, even though it doesn't always feel like it when you're in it is actually mm -hmm. so much worse and harder than trying something and having it, you know, fall flat on its face or whatever. Absolutely. One of the things that I tell all of my clients and I repeat it like a fucking mantra all the time when they're in the middle of something, I'm like, you can't fuck it up. You cannot fuck it up. It doesn't matter what the outcome is. You cannot fuck it up because that, that is the thing is yeah. that I can't make a decision because if I do, I could ruin everything. Nope. You can't fuck it up. If, if everything turns out and, and it spins out of control, then guess what? It was yeah. supposed to spin out of control and there is a recovery. There has never, ever, ever been a time when you haven't been okay. And that time isn't coming tomorrow. So don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. We'll figure it out. Yeah, I know. And I look at that and I, you know, look at all the years that I fought for my paralysis. Like mm -hmm. I fought for staying in the space until I could come up with the perfect solution or set of solutions or whatever, without ever acknowledging that the space I was staying in fucking suck. Yes. Like almost anything else would have been better. Yes. Like, I don't even like it here. Why do I, why do I come back every yeah. day? Yeah. Why am I fighting to stay stuck in the same place because I, you know, am looking for a perfect solution. When never or, a perfect or, solution. or sometimes not looking. Sometimes mm -hmm. getting, we get so comfortable with being uncomfortable or, or being unhappy because you know what is really more scary than, than having what we want is uncertainty. We yes. would rather be unhappy than uncertain. Yes. I would much rather be miserable than not know. Well, guess what? You don't <laughs> fucking know anyway. You made yeah. that whole story up about knowing you don't know anything actually. Yep. You know, there's just enough, there's just enough consistency in this, this human life design to give us the illusion of control. Yes. When yeah. you get, when you, you stand up enough times and put one foot in front of the other, you get the illusion that you're always going to walk until one day you fucking can't. Yeah. And you habit know? and control are not the same thing. No, they are not, but we think that they are. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, we think that they are. So <laughs> they can feel that way. Doing something well, out of force of habit, you can you can create the illusion of control. Absolutely. But it's absolutely. not really the same thing as having No. And and the the truth is is that the joy is in the not trying to control. Mm-hmm. The being untethered to outcome, like not to say that you can't want what you want with your whole heart, but if it doesn't fucking happen, you got to be able to be okay with that. Yeah. Like, you know, but that starts with us being able to be an acceptance of where we are in if, any given moment. So, you know, you can be in the space of, I really love my body and I could use, I could lose a few pounds, mm-hmm. but I accept today, this is the body I have and it's got a rose on it. And guess what? I love these fucking rolls. They're insulating. It's wintertime. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, and when you're in this space of kind of seeking self-intimacy, I think that, you know, what it can feel like is I don't want to want something or I don't want to acknowledge that I want something with my whole heart in case I don't get it. Mm-hmm. But you know what? If you don't acknowledge it, you're not going to get it anyway. Right. Being Giving a voice desire, whatever that may be, the chance of moment by a gaz- Yes. Yeah. By a, by a gaz- You know, like I'm here for all. I can't tell you, I have way more losses than gains where desire is concerned. I have wanted way more things than I've actually acquired. And I still want. Yes. I want, I want, I want. Now the flip side of that. And you want to end, want, I think. Absolutely. Too. Yeah. Absolutely. But on the other end of this continuum is, is this, because these are this is where the other group of people live. The other group of people don't live in the space of, I don't want to make a request. I'm afraid. I don't want to have desire. The mm-hmm. other people live in the land of, I desire so much that I live in the space of, longing because now I am getting something out of longing and the thing that I'm getting is not having. So you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's the other end of that. It's not that everyone there, there's a whole other extreme and I happen to live on the extreme, that extreme. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really good. I love longing. Like oh, I went into a whole diatribe just today about one of my girlfriends who's anticipating a date. And I was like, Oh, don't you just love wanting it? Don't you just love there's a space where you get to imagine what it's going to be like and what are you going to smell like? What are you going to wear? Are you going to wear panties? Oh my God. You know, like I love that shit that I sometimes am like, wait a minute, wait a minute, homegirl. You are never having because you're too busy wanting. So there's, yeah. so there's the opposite end. So, so. It's well, because busy. when you're just in that space of, of longing, the possibilities are infinite. Possibilities are not the same as having. Yeah. And you know, so I, and I, again, like, I can't tell you how many times I say, oh my God, the possibilities are endless. But see, the key is that is not possibilities. It's endless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, very true. Yes. Um, so you have to be really careful to make sure too. that you're not like painting all these things. And I, I've done that in business. Mm-hmm. I've done that in relationships. Oh, longing. Oh, please let me want it some more. (laughs) And then never have it. So I I have to ask myself all the time. That's like choosing, right? Like I know one of the things that I struggled with for so long was I wanted to identify that one great passion that was going to be like Mm -hmm. the thing that would like pull me forward through the rest of my life, you know, like whatever. and. At the same time, I was so resistant to that same idea on another level because choosing one thing felt like unchoosing all of the other things. Um, There's a tarot card that like perfectly sums this up for me. I think it's a six or seven of cups. And it's like the guy is standing, you know, kind of looking off into the sky and there's like all these little clouds with the cups in them. And one of them has jewels and one of them has money and one, of, you know, like all the different things, but it's like, it's all theoretical. Um, and you know, it's kind of like being in suspended animation Yep. from this, like sort of not making a choice. Um, well, you know what I, I was, again, like, of course, um, everything you talk about comes up, right? I was just saying to one of my friends today, she's in the middle of choosing something. And one of her friends said to her, you know, I support you, but I'm worried that this thing might, might be a step backward. And so, you know, I said to her, I said, I think her heart's in the right place, but I don't know if there's a such thing as backward. I think that the idea that the only way to move is forward is really um, harmful to us. 
Mm -hmm. Because we, we think of time and everything in it as this linear thing. And I don't know that that's actually true, you know? And so there, if, if you have to take a step backwards or to the right or to the left or mm -hmm. catty cornered or, you know, you know, um, adjacent to like, like, like it's fine. <laughs> All of yeah, I mean, and it's about, it's about motion, right? It's right. Just about like getting yourself unstuck somehow. And I also think we have this idea of following this one true passion and it comes, it comes from all over the place, right? Like it's the hero's journey. It's in every movie we see, like every book we read, yes. like that kind of thing. But in truth, I don't think very many people have a point in their life where all of a sudden they get this lightning strike of, oh my God, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And if you did, like, God, how boring, you know, like, I think there's only a handful of those people, you know, like yeah. the valedictorian of my graduating class. She said she wanted <laughs> to be a doctor. I saw her years later at Starbucks wearing a white coat, you know, like, there you <laughs> go. <laughs> but I don't think that that's normal. I mean, no. and, and using that loosely, I don't think that that's usual for most. And even within that, right? Like there are kind of, you know, like shifts in the road. You know, like even for a doctor that practice, you know, like mm -hmm. specialization, like all these different, you know, kind of things. Right. And I think that we can only really ever look a reasonable amount of time down the road. I don't know what I'm going to be doing or what I'm going to want in my life or want to be doing in 10 years, but I can reasonably look out and say, okay, next year, this is sort of where I want to be, mm -hmm. you know, the year after this is sort of where I want to be. But I think that, that feeling of having to make a choice that will then determine everything forever is some of where that paralysis comes in. Well, and that's also the, that's the, the, the bill we are, you mm -hmm. know, very young. We're sold this idea that you should know. They ask you in fucking grade school, what do you want to be yes. when you grow up? That's ridiculous. Yeah. What we're pushing you? specialization younger and younger. Right. On kids. Look, can I be, can I be in third grade and just want to get to fourth? Like that's all mm -hmm. I just want. Can I just want to get to summer vacation? Yeah. Because that's where, how you measure it. Everything's measured by the school year when you're a kid. Like, mm -hmm. um, I'm ready for spring break. It's January. When is spring break? You know, spring break is over. Yeah. When is, when is, um, when are we out of school? When is summer break? Summer break is over. Like, okay, fall yeah. is here. Like when is Christmas break? Like uh -huh. that's, that's as far like quarters. Can we just go with quarters? <laughs> yeah. Well, and even when you're talking about like, you know, things like career strategy, right? Like I work with a lot of people that are in that space of wanting to transition careers or move out of their, you know, existing career and into something else. And a lot of times they feel paralyzed by this question of what do I want to do for the rest of my life? And, you know, I'm usually the one that's like, fuck that. What do you want to do for the next three to five years? Yes. And yes. after that, we'll see. Absolutely. You know, I'm a big fan of not yet and maybe never. Mm-hmm. When someone says, are you bisexual? Not yet. That sounds really strange. <laughs> I, I haven't had an experience with a woman yet as an adult. You yep. know, I've kissed girls as a kid. Not had a woman experience with a woman. I don't know if that's always going to be true. So yeah. today, not yet. Not you yet. Know, I love that. I love that because I can apply to I, so many things, you know? Yeah, not yet. I don't know. I, you know, because I don't want to box, box myself in either way. I don't know. And, you know, I have changed. I, I've experimented with different religions. Right now, I'm completely uh, secular. <laughs> but, you know, like when I, when I tried on Buddhism, I said to them, I'm doing this. I enjoy it right now. I don't know how long I'm going to feel like that. And right now, I'm Buddhist. And I may, I may stay Buddhist. Um, I may not. It lasted for five years. Wow. That was it. Like, yeah. <laughs> not yet. Maybe never. And just for now. Yeah. That's fine. That makes total sense. So tell me about, to kind of connect back to the, the sensuality piece, what I found is that your body can be an amazing compass for what is going on with you and for helping you kind of see things that you might not see otherwise or notice things that you're feeling that you really maybe haven't acknowledged. Um, how have you seen that play out and, and how do you encourage people to sort of start paying attention to well your body is the compass for everything you know there are so many things that your body recognizes that you just don't have the awareness i'll give you a great example i was reading a story um about this this man he happened to be a doctor and his wife was craving iceberg lettuce which is a very specific and unusual craving but she was craving it so, to so to such a degree not just like salad iceberg lettuce specifically. Well, <laughs> as it turns out, iceberg lettuce has a, a either a chemical or an enzyme or something in it 
that is um, that happens to tie into breast cancer. It's like a deficient thing that that gets taken out of the body when someone has breast cancer. So that, of course, he was a doctor, so that made him curious. And wouldn't you know it? She went to the doctor. She had an exam. They did a biopsy, and she had um, she was like stage one or two. So, wow. so yes, like, you know, people see it all the time. One of the most common, they call them pikas, right? So the most common pika is probably ice when there's an iron deficiency. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people, when there's an iron deficiency, they either crave ice, which is, I had that experience, or they crave dirt, which is very unusual, you know? Um, so the body is, is absolutely a gauge. Um, there was a story that I read once about this. He was a comedian, a very, um, he was successful, but he happened to have a kink and his kink was that he liked to you know, have his urine, do golden showers and have a woman Uh drink his urine. Well, his girlfriend, longtime girlfriend, she did that for him. And one day she said, you know, baby, your, your urine tastes like birthday cake. Well, he had diabetes. Wow. And if she had not been partaking of his golden elixir, (laughs) he may, who knows how long, if ever he would have found out. So the body is the compass. It will tell you everything. Yeah. You know, there's oftentimes one of my favorite questions to ask when I first start working to someone is how's your bowels? Because if the person says, and women have, this is a very common problem for women, you know, I'm, I'm constipated because usually women have a hard time letting go of shit. So yes, <laughs> their bodies have a hard time letting go of shit. So like it is, it is, it comes up so so frequently in so many levels, you know, even body language, when you, sometimes your mind will tell you a story about how, you know, you're feeling some kind of way about somebody and your mind is like, no, they're okay. Or this is a good connection or so-and-so likes this person. But if you pay attention to your body, you might find yourself crossing your arms over your chest, you know, crossing Mm -hmm. your legs. If you're constantly crossing next to somebody, it's because your body is saying this person is not safe. So your yeah. body is the compass to everything. And so I notice a lot of times, you know, you can feel an emotion in your body before it even registers as an emotion. Oh. Well, because um, emotion is not a thought. It's a, it's a physiological experience. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's an experience in the nervous system. It's not, you know, like, it's not like this ethereal thing. We think that we think about how we feel. No, you actually feel. That's why it's feelings. You feel how you feel. It's a neurological experience. So your nervous system registers everything. It's supposed to, not just fear. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. It's, it should register things. everything. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I, you know, I always have people start when we work together is where are you feeling in your body? And Absolutely. You know, where, where does this emotion show up? How does this feel? How does that feel? Because oftentimes that gives us an opportunity to say, wow, here's the emotion. I'm going to consciously process it instead of just letting it process me. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's again, it's, uh, your body's the only home you actually ever have. Mm-hmm. No one can, ev- the only time you get evicted from this home is, is on the way out, like permanently. <laughs> You know, every other domicile, someone can tell you to leave or you could choose to leave this body Mm -hmm. though. It's, this is the home and it comes with all of the, all of the amenities, all of the tools. It comes with everything you need need to navigate this whole life thing, which is why we need to really practice living in it, like being present with it. Like this feels funny or this feels really wonderful. I really love this sensation. Just yesterday, I went to a Korean bathhouse and, you know, they've got that ice pool. Well, everyone that gets in the ice pool wants to clench up so tight. And I'm like, you're just making it harder on yourself. Stop doing that. (laughs) Like, just (laughs) breathe and relax. Your nervous system can handle this. And actually, the more contrast and uncomfortable we get, like when when water is one of the ways we can prime our nervous system to be more expansive. Because Mm -hmm. a lot of times we can't handle things not because we can't really deal with an emotion, but simply because our nervous system is so constricted that it can't handle the emotion. But if we can practice priming our nervous system, you know, and sometimes, um, and this sounds really strange, but people that like scary movies have a greater capacity for, you know, uncomfortable things. They literally scare themselves all the fucking time. (laughs) And so their nervous system can handle shit. That's fascinating. I haven't heard that before. It's the truth. You know, like people like you, you, the more, because it's, it's uncomfortable. So yes, scary movie makes you jump. Mm -hmm. You're constantly in anticipation. You know what I mean? But consequently, 
those people have a tendency to not overreact sometimes. Now that's not true for everybody, but, but you, wonder, you know, cause obviously like the more chicken or egg thing a little bit too, right? Like are the people that are attracted to oh, movies, the people that already have like kind of a more grounded nervous system or are, do they have a more grounded nervous system because you know, they're watching scary movies. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Well, and then the, you know, that's also a spectrum thing, like everything, right? Because there right. are some people that enjoy being scared Mm-hmm. that actually have have a very have no emotional tools either because i've seen both mm-hmm. like people that go to like all the halloween shits you know they want somebody to, to jump out and scare the fuck out of them they want that right mm-hmm. but sometimes those people also when something jarring happens they actually don't know how to navigate so yeah. so there's a spectrum you know there's For definitely sure. but that's true about every yeah definitely so <laughs> If you were giving someone advice about like how do you start reconnecting with your body, what would be the very first thing that you would tell them to do? Put your cell phone away when you eat. Oh, okay. Have a distraction-free meal so that you can taste everything, so that you can be aware of texture and sensation, so that you can even feel how your body receives certain things. Because there are people with allergies that mm-hmm. if they just pay the fucking attention, they wouldn't need to go get allergy testing. It would be like, you know, when I eat this, my stomach does this thing immediately. You know what I mean? So so like put your phone away and have, you know, and sometimes at least have one meal a day where it's just you and your food and not you and your spouse or you and your kids or you watching YouTube or, you know, whatever, watching Mm -hmm. Family Guy. My daughter likes to watch Family Guy when she, you know, like put your phone away. Have a meal where it's just you and your food. You know, see how much you enjoy or not enjoy something. Mm -hmm. You know, why did you enjoy it? You know, not like it was good. What the fuck does that mean? It was good. What is that? What was good? You know, I really thought the texture of the pasta was just so perfect. And the, the sauce had just enough salty, but it had a pinch of sweet in it, you know, and I could taste nutmeg, I think. You know what I mean? Like be with it so that you can feel all of it. That would be the very, like a lot of my work incidentally um, surrounds food. One of my clients, when we first started working together, I said to her, tell me, you know, tell me what you eat, but I want to know who you eat with, who you cook for. Mm -hmm. And she was like, and months later, months later, she went, um, she went on to some event and she was there like a day early and she was staying in like a, a community kind of thing. And she was like, we stopped for food. And that night I cooked for them. I was like, three months ago, you didn't even want to cook for your husband. Mm -hmm. But her relationship changed when she started paying attention. And she was like, you know, I thought it was so strange that I contacted you about sensuality and we spent so much time talking about food. Food is a very intimate experience. Yeah. And you cooking for someone is, is a really sensual experience, absolutely. right? Like you're it's thinking about very, all of the, yeah, it's, which is. Absolutely. One of a uh, same client, actually, she, um, her mom was coming to her house and she, you know, she was like, it's been a long time since she's been here. And well, she was like, what should we do? And I was like, cook together. And I was like, except for since she's the mom, don't make her cook for you. She's your Mm -hmm. sous chef this time. Because I was like, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, that might not naturally come up in conversation otherwise, but the kitchen is the most intimate house in the, in the intimate room in the house, regardless of whether you cook or not. When you have a house party, where are all the people? Everybody's always in the kitchen. kitchen. When you have Thanksgiving or Christmas, even if, even if you're not eating, you gather around the island or the mm-hmm. table, the kitchen is the most intimate room in the house. And that's why it's such an important part of intimate. So yeah. a lot of my work is about food. So <laughs> well, and okay, which makes a really nice segue into something else that I'm dying to talk about, which is Fat Valley Baker. Oh, um. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, that, that, it, that in and of itself, like the, was created, um, at first out of curiosity, which is important to sensuality and intimacy. And then it became about intimacy because initially when I started baking cookies, I would bake to say thank you to people. So, you know, like I once sent cookies to, to like a manager at my daughter, at my sister's job because, and with a note that said, you know, thank you for being so nice and supportive of my sister or, you know, the guy at the tire place who, who changed the light bulb, you know, he's a tire guy, he changed <laughs> the light bulb for me. I came back, I'm like, I brought you cookies. <laughs> so initially it was a way for me to say thank you, 
like it was about an expression of, of love and, and appreciation um, for, for, you know, doing something or, or, or being something to someone that I cared about. So it was about connecting. Like, you know, I see you, I see what you're doing. I'm, I appreciate you. And I, and I made this for you. I didn't buy that. I made this for mm-hmm. you. So, so Fat Belly Baker came of that. And so our dozens are 16 instead of 12. Um, so, you know, a, a regular dozen is 12, a baker's uh-huh. dozen is 13, a fat belly baker's dozen is 16. And that's because I would like for people to buy cookies for, for someone. Mm-hmm. And then because they did that, they get four cookies. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love that. That is well, for them, brilliant. For you. <laughs> well, and when you first started posting all of the delicious looking stuff that you're always posting on Instagram and, you know, said that you were moving into this, you know, also doing this different business with cookies. Like I got to admit, like my first response was like, of course, because that <laughs> just goes so well with the sensuality work and kind of, you know, because it is, it's like something that's so like sensual and comforting and you know you can do so many things with a cookie it, it can be absolutely an and adventure or a trip home you know absolutely and you share cookies like cookies are something that people share even stingy people share cookies yeah you know it, it's because again it's it's all about connecting and there is i never tire of the smell of of cookies baking no and never like sometimes told. i'm mixing a batch and i say i, I never get tired of smelling this like I, it never gets old. It never, it never gets old. So, yeah. but it, it, that's how it came up. And, and incidentally though, cause I've been baking for, for a long time before I ever decided to do something with it. But what happened was my, my coaching business was, was tanking like no money. I could not, I couldn't squeeze blood out of the turnip. I could not find a client under a rock. Like I could mm-hmm my birthday came up that year, I said to myself, I am going to, I'm going to buy some domains. Okay. Yeah. So, so I bought a bunch of domains with the intention of opening the doors and the windows for more for, to allow money to flow into my life. Uh And I had already, like, I had already named it in my head years before when, um, when I, the first time the dough made 16 cookies. And it was for someone that was buying, that was buying cookies to give to her husband for his birthday. Uh And I said, well, these 12 are for him. These four are for her because a fat belly baker's dozen is is 16 cookies. So, so I already had the name and then I bought the domain and that was how it kind of started though. It took for my other business though, to, to pause in income for me to, to do something else. But what I wish someone had told me years ago was that how important it is to diversify your income. I had no idea. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm glad that that happened because if it hadn't, I never would have done it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I feel like, you know, it's, it's so you and kind of who you are to bring this, these ideas about sensuality and sweetness and intimacy Mm -hmm. and, you know, like it's like a tangible expression. Absolutely. And sweetness is such an important thing. You know, incidentally, you know, when I, it's one of the things that I encourage my, my clients, especially when they're going through a particularly challenging time, you know, I will say like, what are you going to do on purpose to invite sweetness into your life? Like, you know, even if it's something as simple as taking a spoonful of honey every day, Mm -hmm. you know, like that can be, it can be that simple. It doesn't have to be like, Oh, I'm going to go out and buy a new Porsche. You know, it doesn't have to be that it can be something like you literally can go to your pantry or I'm going to eat one cookie. I'm Mm -hmm. going to be with this cookie. I'm going to taste every morsel of this cookie. I'm going to feel the texture. I'm going to be with this, or it could be a cup of coffee or it could be a cup of water. It it really, yeah. It could be anything, but but to be like kind of being with yourself and absolutely. Absolutely. I can't tell you how pleasurable, like everything, like everything gives me pleasure. So even when, even something like food, if I ask someone about like, I'm, I'm constantly asking like, you know, about lunch or what did you like, whatever the last meal was, when I talk to someone, I ask them like, what did you have? But I, I always ask, what did you enjoy? What did you enjoy for lunch today? What did you enjoy for breakfast? Because I don't want them to just, oh, I had, I want, no, what did you enjoy about that? Because yeah. you might not have enjoyed it. You could say mm-hmm. like, actually, I didn't enjoy it, but you wouldn't have thought about it, even if you ate it anyway. If no one ever invites you to shift your focus to, to pleasure, because I think for a long time, 
you know, our, our ancestors use sensuality, but not, but it was for survival. You know, yeah. it was about like smelling danger and smelling, which, you know, this bush is poisonous. We shouldn't eat this kind of thing. Like we used it for survival, but now we live in the best time in human history to be a human the least mm-hmm. violent times ever, regardless of what it looks like. This is the least violent time of our, our existence ever. And because of that, now we can use those same senses because they're not a different set. The same senses that we use to escape and save ourselves, we can use to enhance and create pleasure and enjoyment in our lives because now we're in a space where we've evolved enough where that's actually something we can do on purpose. Yeah. And that's a powerful thing, like getting in touch with sensuality and pleasure is I find like in, you know, especially for women is such a powerful thing because oh, it oh my goodness. gives you so much agency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I am look, my, one of my favorite words this year is lavish. I'm like, you know, Ooh, I want to be like lavish. that one. Yes. When someone's like, oh, well, no, 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 no. I'm like, no, honey, I want to be lavish. I don't just want to <laughs> enjoy it. I don't just want to know. I want to be lavish. I want to feel luxurious. I want it to be heavy and weighty and sultry and all the things. (laughs) Yes. All the things. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we get to be that without it being, you know, like, like I have, I don't, I don't give a fuck if someone thinks I'm a slut. I don't give a damn. So (laughs) what? Yeah. You know, like, I, I, I mean, I, 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 right now I'm practicing polyamory. And of course, almost everybody I know is monogamous. Well, that's their business. Like, <laughs> have nothing to do with me. And it's, and it's not that there's anything wrong with monogamy, but I happen to like lots. So <laughs> I'm, I like to be lavished and I have lovers that like to lavish. It. <laughs> so. And it's luxurious. Oh my goodness, yes. You know what I'm super curious about right now, though, what? is is female-led relation. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can I tell you, I had a lover. I had to fire him not long ago, but I had a lover who would greet me at the door on his hands and knees, bowed at my feet, and he would kiss them when I walked in the door. That shit was hot as fuck. And I yeah. loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. So like, I'm like, yes, like, why not? I am, I take up a lot of space. I have always been labeled too much. And it took me a long time to, to not try to tiptoe. Cause I don't know how to not be a lot. I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't know how to know that's like my fucking pet peeve is women being told they are too much. Oh my goodness. I, I was told that like my whole life, but I don't know how to not be a lot. I don't. And so I feel really comfortable. I am, I am bossy. I am fucking bossy. Unapologetically bossy. I give me a little space and I will lead. I will take over in a minute. And I don't apologize for that. And that's how I am, you know? And, and honestly, that's also one of the things that people enjoy the most about me. Yeah. Like that's who I am. Like I, I take up space. I am, I get loud. I am passionate. I love juicy things. And I talk nasty all the fucking time. I am unapologetic about that. But I think it's so important for other women to see you out in the world doing that. Can I tell you though? More of that. Let me tell you though, the because this is this is patriarchy though. Because I also get challenged because a lot of women can't relate to this because Mm -hmm. they're too busy trying to turn down their volume that when they see me, that they they sometimes are they they're sometimes put off or intimidated. Mm-hmm. so so that but that's patriarchy like, yeah, when, and it is and it's like the self-policing part of patriarchy you know that's yeah. that's really what internalized oppression is is it's you know women enforcing the rules of patriarchy on each other and i find that a Absolutely. lot of times when women are doing the enforcing they over enforce like i uh-huh. think that mm-hmm. You know, for women, a woman is too much before she even would be for a man, if that makes sense. Like, I think that our our too muchness tolerance is often Mm -hmm. lower from women than it is for men. Oh, for sure. Really interesting. For sure. It's, I have, I have had that experience my entire life. Yeah. I I have had that experience quite a bit as well. (laughs) Yes. And you know, so I've got this too much label slapped on my forehead Mm -hmm. and then it, and then I'm the angry black woman. 
when I'm like, a lot of the time, I'm not even mad. You haven't seen me mad yet. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I'm, this is just how I talk. Yeah. But yeah. people don't like, because it's easier to put me in that box. Because mm-hmm. then you can dismiss everything that I'm saying. Yes. As long, no, no, she's just, she's just loud and, and she black because that's how they are. You know what I mean? It's easy to, to do that. But I say really great shit all the time. Yes. And I, you. you know, I'm like, no, if you're paying attention, yeah. you, you are going to learn something if you stand next to me. That is just how it is. You are going to come away with something. I'm going to say something that you're going to be thinking about tomorrow. So you can dismiss me if you want to, but I'm going to be there with you because you can't forget me. Oh my God. I love that. And I can absolutely vouch for its truth (laughs) because every single time we talk, that is exactly how I feel. Well, I thank you so much. I just went to, um, I was at the optometrist on Saturday and I was choosing glasses and, and there was this young man. He, he was probably, if he was in his twenties, he was very early twenties and his mom, his mom was getting her exam. So I'm like trying on glasses. Hey, I know he was tired of me. I was like, you know, I really want some red ones. And I was like, you know why? And I said, because no one ever says, remember the woman with the black glasses? No one ever says that. (laughs) Everyone always like, no, no, no. She was wearing red glasses and she was loud. Can I just say, my friend, that you are unforgettable, (laughs) red glasses or not? (laughs) Look, my mother would agree with you. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) And I mean that in the best possible way. Well, it's, you know... I don't know. It, initially, it wasn't something I tried to do. You know, it was just, it just would happen. But you know, that yeah, wasn't always if, a good thing. If you had but, tried, it would have been different, right? Oh, like, absolutely. When you're, you know, because then it would have been a performance and not mm-hmm. your authentic self. And I absolutely. think that's what makes all the difference. I agree. Because, you know, I think, but, but that's being in your body again, because yes. your body can feel authenticity. Yes. And that's the difference is that it's like lying. Like you never, ever, like I hear people, you know, I need to trust them. They need to earn. No, they don't. You need to trust them to be who they are because your body is going to be able to tell when they're lying to you. Yes. Because when someone lies, their body changes and your body feels that change. Mm -hmm. And that's how you fucking smoke a liar out. You don't need to be worried about their eyes were being shifty. Fuck that. Your body will feel the difference. And not only that, but I find it's even more powerful. Like your body knows when you're lying to yourself. And it can't lie. And it can't lie. Your body cannot lie. And I mean, you know, with the exception of sociopaths, they're the only ones and they're not Mm -hmm. that many. Yep. Yeah. Thank that's, goodness. that's a totally different thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. But the, the average person, even, even if they, even if their mind or their ego has convinced them that they believe what they're saying, their body is never on board because your body cannot lie. And yeah. other bodies are designed to be in connection with other bodies, which is why mm-hmm. your body can feel the difference. Yeah. But you yeah. can And when you get in touch with that, you're not, you have, yeah, you need, you yep. need to be in touch with that to get absolutely get those Because you'll dismiss it. It's not that you don't, yeah, it's not it's that, that you don't feel it when you don't know what it is. Yeah. You dismiss it. Yep. Everything's mm-hmm. just like, no, I, I felt something and you just blow it off. And then yeah. afterwards you're like, oh, but I felt, yes, you should have listened yeah. to that. That. <laughs> right. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we have to wind up, but thank you so, so much for coming on. This was so much fun and it was so great to talk to you. I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm so glad you're doing this. Like, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Well, right back at you. Um, (laughs) I'm looking forward to coming out to California and trying Fat Belly Baker cookies. Oh, look, I can't wait to fatten your (laughs) belly up with them. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Stacey. And um, I would love to have you back again sometime soon. Of course. Look, you know, I could, look, I'd love to talk. So yes, please, please, please. For sure. Thanks again.